today's message is called A Table in the Presence. And today you'll find out why as we continue through the message. Uh, but the first reason why is because we will be celebrating at the Lord's table today. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. So to take some of the mystery uh, away from that, let me share with you how our church does it and compare it to how other churches do it um, as far as how often. Uh, you all may not know how often uh, we as a church do it or why on some Sundays you come and we're doing the Lord's Supper and others are not and maybe you've not really thought about it. It's like, oh, today Lord's Supper Day. We, there is actually an order behind it. Um, there are some churches that celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together only once a year. Uh, there are others who do it every week. And there are some who do it even more than every week, but they celebrate it literally every single time they get together. Uh, what was traditional, uh, at least in the mid-20th century, for a lot of Baptist churches, uh, was once a quarter. Um, which, when I came to this church, uh, and the church was only about a year old uh, when I came, I, I came in 1999, and they opened their doors on Easter 1998. So it's literally been 20 years um, since they opened their doors here, this building. Um, but at that time, they, what they were doing was instead of four times a year, they were doing it six times a year. And so that's the tradition we've continued. Uh, the Bible does not say how often to do it. Jesus just says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So there's not a specific command about how often we do it. We can do it as often as we like. Um, what I remember the pastor saying when I came in 1999, the pastor who was, who was here, he said it, it just didn't seem like once a quarter was often enough. And uh, he, didn't, he said, we don't want to do it so much that it just sort of becomes empty ritual, uh, but we don't want to do it so infrequently either. And so that's why we do it approximately six times a year. And so right now what we do is we do it on the first Sunday of even numbered months. Now, again, the Bible doesn't tell us how to do that. There will be all kinds of ways for us to organize it. But in case you're wondering, that is how our church does it. So if you're looking at the calendar and you see it's the first Sunday in an even-numbered month, we were probably going to do the Lord's Supper that day. Now, occasionally we'll change it a little, uh, depending on what else is going on. And so the first Sunday of the even-numbered month this time would have been last week. And so we moved it uh, one week to today. Now, what's really interesting, and you can call it a coincidence if you want, is that I've been preaching through the Gospel of Luke and in order. And it just so happens that the passage that we're on today is Jesus celebrating the Last Supper, his last Passover meal, when he institutes the Lord's Supper. That's today's message. That was already on the schedule. And so there it is. And so uh, it's awesome when that happens and and. You probably wouldn't be surprised how many times God works that kind of thing out. Uh, the other thing I want you to know is that um, it is important to Derek and I that the Lord's Supper, when we put it in the service, not just sort of be an empty ritual and not just sort of be tacked on. Well, it's the first Sunday of even another month. I guess we got to do it. You know, where are we going to stick it? Uh, no, each time when that's the case, we talk about where we can place in the service where it will be the most meaningful. And that's why sometimes you'll see it moved around. Sometimes we'll do it at the end of the sermon. We might do it before the sermon. We might do it earlier in the service. And what we're trying to do is put it where it will be the most meaningful. So it doesn't just sort of become an empty ritual. So it becomes an important part of the service every time that we do it. And so today, because we will be looking at uh, literally Jesus' Last Supper when he institutes the Lord's Supper, uh, we will be doing the, the Lord's Supper together uh, after the sermon. Uh, and so if you know Jesus as your Savior, you are invited uh, to join with us. Uh, please, if you are a guest, do not feel awkward or uncomfortable because this happens. Uh, because different churches have different traditions about who can participate. Um, I have seen, and this happened to some friends of my wife and I. There were some folks that we were had been sharing the gospel with. And they came on a Christmas Eve and we celebrated the Lord's Supper that Christmas Eve. And because they were from a different church tradition, they were all of a sudden awkward and uncomfortable because they didn't know if they were allowed to participate or not. And all of a sudden, something that should have been very meaningful and very wonderful and special, I saw this family over here arguing and stressing out about what they should do about it. 
And so we don't want it to become that for you. Uh, so, so if you choose not to participate, that is just fine. You just pass it on. Nobody's going to notice. No one's going to be whispering about you or anything uh, like that. Um, something I want to share with you that you probably haven't heard very much is you know that what was happening at the, this last supper, this final meal with his disciples, was the Passover. Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. That's what they were doing. And though we're not told about it, they would have done this every year. So in other words, this is the third or fourth one they've done together. And they would have done it, as, as was tradition, inside the city walls of Jerusalem. So this is not the first time uh, that they've done this together. In fact, this is something that they've celebrated their whole lives. And so if you can imagine um, a tradition in your family, whether it be Christmas or Easter or something like that, that you do every year as a family, that's what, what Passover was like for them. This is something that they looked forward to. This is something that uh, the Passover meal was prepared over and for days in advance. And family is coming in. It was, it was exciting and special and a very, very meaningful time and something that everybody looked forward to. And the other thing that's really cool about Passover is it involved the family. And so there were very specific things uh, that they did and the family would do together. And since Jesus is celebrating this with his disciples, and since he's the leader, he would have adopted uh, the role in the Passover meal of the head of the family. He would have done the things, um, and we see him doing some of that, uh, that the head of the family would do. Also, traditionally, the youngest child... Um, in this family meal would also play a part, asking specific questions and allowing the head of the family to answer those questions and talk about why it is we do what we do and to explain the ritual and the symbolism. and what it, So they're not simply doing it, but they're teaching, they're learning, they're reliving uh, their history and they are worshiping each time they celebrate the Passover meal together. So this is, was a really, really big deal. Now we know pretty well what the tradition was, that is how they celebrated the Passover meal in Jesus' day. The way that Jews today celebrate it is very similar, but they're, you know, over time, you know, rituals get added. And so there's some extra things they do now they were not necessarily doing in Jesus' day. But we know pretty well what they were doing. We have written record from t around 200 AD, a very detailed description of how the Passover was celebrated. And this written record follows an oral tradition dating back 400 years before that, 200 years before Jesus was born. And so we know pretty close how Jesus would have uh, celebrated the Passover uh, with his disciples. So I'm going to go over that with you just a little bit. So get ready. It's exciting. Okay. So here's... Here's what they did. First of all, they have to prepare. The preparation is a big deal. Uh, they would have to se select the right herbs, they select the right, the correct bread, and someone in the family, often a child, see, this is really cool, right? The kids get to participate, would select the lamb for sacrifice. I know, right? <laughs> That's just mean. Uh, but a child would select which lamb uh, would be sacrificed and would be usually a one year old unblemished male. Then the evening before the Passover was, was eaten, the night before, the, the head of the family would lead the, the whole family. This is fun. This is great. He would lead the whole family through the house with a candle searching for leaven. And they would look in every nook and cranny. And no leaven is supposed to be in the house at that time. And so uh, what they would do is if, if Jews had leaven, they would often sell it or give it away to their Gentile friends. So they didn't have it in their house uh, at the time of the Passover. Because what they were, what they were remembering was God rescuing them from Egypt. And so one of the things God told them when he instituted um, what we call the Passover meal is he said, you need to get rid of all your leaven because since you're leaving Egypt in a hurry and you don't have time to wait for your bread to rise, every year you're going to eat unleavened bread as a reminder that your ancestors left Egypt in a hurry. And everything that they do was a reminder of what God had done in rescuing them from Egypt. And so then at the time of the meal, as the guests and family members would enter the home to celebrate the Passover, a servant or a slave would be there to wash their feet. 
Now, if you know what happens, we find out from John, the gospel writer, that Jesus did this, which was very, very weird. Because a servant would do this, and instead, he, the head of the family in that role, takes on the role of the servant and washes their feet. Once they got there, they would, uh, after having their feet washed, there was a ritual hand washing uh, the Jews would, would do before every single meal. And then they would have specific things set in front of them, including candles and herbs and unleavened bread uh, and vinegar and vegetables. They would recline at the table. And though the painting, The Last Supper, is a beautiful painting, it didn't work that way. There was, the table would have been a very low table, and usually there would be some kind of cushion that you would recline on, and the table would be here, and you would recline on one hand, and you would recline on the hand you're not eating on. And so if you were right-handed, you would be on your left elbow, and if you were left-handed, you'd be on your right elbow so that you could use uh, your dominant hand to eat with. And in that way, people would be around their table with their feet pointing out away from the table. Very relaxed environment, as you can as you can. Picture and imagine, very easy for someone to go around and wash everybody's feet. And so, it would begin with the first cup. There were four cups of wine, or four times that, that the ritual cup was drunk from. Drank from? That they would drink from. Four, t <laughs> four times. There were four ritual cups. The wine was red and warm. And so they would begin with the first, and there would be a blessing uh, spoken, a prayer over the first cup, the pr a prayer of sanctification. And then they would re recite the scripture from Exodus 6, 6 through 7. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And then they would drink the first cup. Then the, the bitter herbs and the first dipping of bread would happen. And so the head, of the, the head of the house would bring out the herbs, and with the chief guest of honor, who would be the person on his right, he would dip it and then pass all the herbs around. At this point, and this is a little strange, but all the food would be removed from the table at that point. Like, what? And the reason for that would be to bring up the, heighten the interest of the evening and to bring the focus on what happens next. Because at, that, at this point, before the second cup, the youngest, the youngest child would ask, why is this night different from all other nights? And then that would be answered by the father. And he would give an entire history of Israel from Abraham up to Moses and the giving of the law. If you want to see what the traditional or typical speech was that was given in recounting Israel's history, all that you need to do is go to the book of Acts and read verses 2 through 38. Because before Stephen is stoned, before he is executed, and he describes the history of Israel before telling them that they're guilty of sin, he basically follows the exact same speech that was given by the head of the family every year at Passover. And so he follows that ritual speech if you want to see that. And so he, he describes Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and going down into Egypt and being enslaved and Moses and coming and rescuing them and the ten plagues and then going through the wilderness and the receiving the ten commandments. Then all the food would be returned to the table and it would be time for the father to explain the significance of the lamb and the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread. They would sing... In the first half of two psalms, Psalm 113 and Psalm 114, and they would sing that together. And I won't read the whole thing to you, but here's a little part of it. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And then after singing from that psalm, they would pray over the second cup. And the scripture would be recited from Exodus chapter 6. I will deliver you from your bondage. And then there would be a second hand washing. And then it will be time to eat the vegetables and some of the unleavened bread. And then they would pray over the bread. And so the, pray, the bread would be broken. And what the host would do is he would reach over and break the guest of honor's bread, the one who was right to his, to his right. And they would dip it together in the oil and bitter herbs, 
And then that guest would turn and break his neighbor's bread and dip it together. And so the bread would be broken and passed and dipped all the way around. And so each person is doing it with and serving the person next to them, who then takes it and does it with and serves the person next to them. And so you see this is very much a community thing. It is something that you are doing with other people. After that, they would eat uh, the meal uh, they would have a thir the third cup and recite another scripture and another blessing over that third cup. And then finally, the fourth cup. And again, another blessing uh, from, the, from the head of the family, from the father. Uh, and he would recite the scripture. Then I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so the next Psalms, after 113 and 14, Psalms 115, 116, 117, 118, would, would be sung as a closing hymn of, of the Passover meal together. And so there it is. Now this takes a long time. And what I want you to see is, I'm not criticizing Thanksgiving, okay? Thanksgiving is awesome. But what do we do, right? We, 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 we might talk about what we're thankful for, or we might say a prayer, and then we all eat. And we talk about whatever, right? But during this meal, every single element is important. There is a prayer. There is a scripture. There is a talking about what God has done for us through the entire meal. The entire meal that they eat together is, is worship. And so this is an important thing that people would look forward to and that they were excited about. And now that you've heard this, now I want you to look with me at Luke chapter 22. We'll, beginning, we'll be beginning in verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now preparations would mean that they had to go and select a lamb, which you know, we don't know this for certain, but a lot of scholars think that John was the youngest disciple. And if that's true, it kind of makes sense. You know, like big brother and little brother being sent. Peter and John are also early leaders uh, in the church. Peter and John are the ones who race together to the tomb after they hear the tomb is empty. And John's kind of proud of the fact that he beats Peter there. And then Peter rushes in the tomb. Um, Peter and John are the ones who have that final walk with Jesus on the beach that we looked at last week. When, when Jesus turns to Peter and asks him three times, do you love me? And, Jesus, and Peter says, yes, you know I love you. And Jesus, and Jesus says, then feed my sheep or take care of my sheep. And John is there also. So Peter and John, these two are a pair quite often, quite frequently. And making preparations would have, would have meant going and buying the herbs and making sure they have the proper oil and spices. It would have meant making sure that they have the unleavened bread. And yes, it would mean selecting and killing the Passover lamb. And obviously also finding a place to do it because they're not at home. And so they're going to have to borrow somebody else's space in order to do it inside the walls of Jerusalem. Look at verse 9. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they ask. A natural question, right? Where are we going to do this at? In verse 10, he replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. Now, we don't know for certain, but one of two, one of two things is going on here. Either Jesus supernaturally knows which house they should choose and which house is going to allow him to, to have the Passover with his meals, or he has already made prearrangements. Now, if you're somebody who thinks that Jesus made prearrangements, this is not at all take away from the power of divinity of Jesus. Okay? Jesus operates in a normal way very frequently in the Gospels and doesn't use miracles to go everywhere. And so it is, it is, not, it is reasonable even that he would have made prearrangements. But we don't know for certain. 
As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. So, if, if Jesus is using his divine knowledge here, he knows this is going to happen. Uh, if he has made prearrangements, then he has told the owner of the house, have a servant or someone, and how are we going to know who you are when I send my disciples to come prepare it? Have one, send one of your male servants to carry the water. Because that would have been weird. Because it was at that time period, it was females who carried the water. And so to see a man carrying a jar of water would be sort of like if, you know, meeting someone that you've never meet, met before and you've got to tell them something about you that's kind of strange, they know which one is you, right? And so the way they'll recognize which person, there's, which servant they're supposed to follow, that's the man carrying a jar of water because there's only going to be one. And so they do this. This is the rest of the instruction. Verse 11. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Now, if Jesus is using supernatural knowledge here, he knows where there's a room available, and he knows who will be ready to allow them to have a room. Or he has made prearrangements, and so when they say, where is the guest room, the guy says, oh yes, I talked to your master about that, let me show you. Verse 12. Wait, let's stay in verse 11. I'm sorry, my, my mistake. Go back to verse 11. I want you to see this. Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. Though the table was lower than ours, and they did not use chairs, there was still a table. A table is a special thing in the Bible. A table is where you eat a meal with someone. We do that even in our culture, right? I mean, we still eat with other people because there is something special about eating with another person. And so this table, this Passover is going to be in the presence of his disciples. Jesus is eating it with his disciples, which means, by the way, it's not even subtle, which means they're his family. Because they're celebrating the meal together that normally you would celebrate with your family. They're his family. Jesus has said this a number of times. Your, your mother and your brothers are here to see you, Jesus. And Jesus says, my, my mother and brothers are those who follow me. Are those who do what I say. And this becomes true in Christianity. This becomes true under the new covenant. That our brothers and sisters are those who also follow Jesus. And frankly, and Jesus says this will happen. People have lost family members because of Jesus. And Jesus gives so much more than what we've lost. Because we inherit an instant, huge, I'm going to make up a word, ginormous family when you become a Christian. And so they are eating with family. And they're with each other. Jesus is with them when they celebrate the Passover meal. And when we celebrate the Last Supper, we are with Christ. We are doing something that he did with his disciples. And it is important that we think of that. That we are not doing this by ourselves, but we are doing something that Jesus did with his disciples. And so this table is in the presence of his disciples. Now look at verse 12. He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. So in other words, it has the table there, a big one for all of you. In other words, there's cushions there available and everything that you need is going to be there. So either Jesus knows this supernaturally or he has made prearrangements. So get all the stuff and make sure it gets to that room. Verse 13. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they obey. And they, so they prepare the Passover. So they do that. They get the lamb. They get the bread. They get the herbs. They go and they meet the, the man with the water jar. They find the room. They prepare it. This is what uh, Peter and John do together. Look at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Now, why were they sent ahead and why were they told water jar? Why were they not told, uh, well, go to uh, 1259 Straight Street, right? Or go to so-and-so's house and it's named. We don't know. Uh, some scholars have speculated it's possible that it's because Judas was still there. 
And because Jesus knew that Judas was planning on betraying him in a time when he was away from crowds, and he didn't want this to happen during the Last Supper, that he, he makes the prearrangement of following someone with a water jar and tells Peter and John that so that Judas wouldn't know where they were. We don't know that. That's just speculation. I like it, though. I like it, though, because I like the idea of Jesus protecting his apostles and him determining and deciding when the betrayal would happen and when it wouldn't happen. Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Look at the next verse. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, uh, in the Greek, we are given um, the figure of speech that was used very often among Hebrew, Hebrew speaking people, which is, with desire, I desire to eat this Passover. So the NIV translates it here as, I have eagerly desired, but the figure of speech was, with desire, I desire. So why would they use desire twice? For emphasis. I really, really, really wanted to do this. I've been, I've been looking forward to this. Now you understand the looking forward to Easter meal with your family or for Christmas dinner with your family, that you get. But why is Jesus looking forward to this one? Honestly, there's several reasons. I think part of it is because he enjoys his disciples. Though it's been with a purpose and though he knew he was going to die for the last three and a half years, they have been a family. And so him celebrating this last Passover, this last special meal with them before he dies, this was important to Jesus. He was looking forward to this. This was sort of his last, I'm saying sort of, it was definitely his last joyous moment before his suffering and death on the cross. This is the last one. This really is his last supper. This is his last time of joy. And so he knows what's coming. Look at verse 16. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And so he looks forward to, he is pointing for it to another table. A table the book of Revelation describes, a great banquet. The marriage supper of the Lamb, when one day we will be with Jesus and being in his, and that table will mean being in his presence forever. But until you're in, we're in the kingdom of God and the presence of God forever, this is going to be my last one. Look at verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. Now what you're going to see here, and we're going to notice in verse 20, there's actually two cups described here. Now I know we just think about the bread and the cup, but there's actually two that Luke describes. This is the first one after, that Luke describes. After taking the cup, he said, give thanks, and, and he said. Part of why I described to you what happened at Passover is so that you would know there are traditionally four cups. Luke tells us about two of the four. This is probably either the first or the second cup partaken in the Passover meal. And so as the head of the family, he gives thanks and he passes the cup around. And they drink from this common ritual cup. And so he would have recited scripture. Now the Greek word here for give thanks uh, is Eucharisto, from which we get the word Eucharist which is why some churches call it that, is because Jesus here gives thanks, and that's what the Greek word means. And he says, take this and divide it among you. And so this table is in the presence of his disciples, looking forward to the time when they will be in the presence of God forever, and it's also in the presence of each other. This is an important thing about the Lord's Supper. This is not something you do by yourself. You don't go home and get out a glass of wine and get out a tortilla and, and break off a piece and, get, and sit at the table and, and say, God, thank you for this bread and thank you for this cup that represents sacrifice for me and eat it and drink it by yourself. You don't do that. That's not what scripture tells us to do. We do it with other Christians because it's intended to be done in the presence of other Christians. The re reason why some people call it communion is because it's done with others in community. You're having communion with God and you're having communion with others as we celebrate what God has done for us. 
And so he says, take this and divide it among you. Now look at verse 19. Sorry, verse 18. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And so Paul reminds us to this in 1 Corinthians, that when we eat and drink this, we proclaim the Lord's death, Paul says, until he comes. We look forward to the final consummation of God's kingdom. And so as they were looking back at God rescuing them from Egypt, Jesus is pointing to him rescuing them from sin and us being rescued for eternity, past, present, and future. Verse 19. And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In Greek, a better way to translate the grammar there is, My body is being given for you. It's, it's happening now. And so, they break the bread, probably passing it around as described, in the Passover ritual, and each one breaks it, dips it with the person next to them, and the next person breaks it, and all the way around in community. Verse 20. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Now, this is probably the fourth cup. And after saying the traditional blessing, he uh, most likely, then what comes next is this. After remembering the old covenant which would have been described to them. Jesus probably during this would have recited to them the history of Israel, would have talked to them about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, would have talked to them about God rescuing them from Egypt, would have described the covenant with Moses, and would have described the Ten Commandments. And after talking about all that, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The prophets had said that there would be a new covenant one day. Jeremiah said that one day there would be a new covenant. And Jesus says, here it is. Now, it's very unlikely they would have believed that was actual blood because, because a good Jew in those days wouldn't drink blood. They would have understood it to be a symbol as a part of the ritual. And Jesus gives it new meaning. Not just remembering the lamb that, is, that was sacrificed at Passover and the lamb that you sacrifice every year. That was your rescued from the destroyer who passed over your house when you put the lamb's blood on the door. But now my, I am the lamb and my blood pays for your sins. And the destroyer will pass over you because of what I have done for you. And so he says, which is poured out for you. This death is for you. This is why it would have been important for the child, and hard maybe, for the child in the family to go and pick out the lamb that was sacrificed. Because though that would be hard to look in the eyes of that little lamb and know that it was going to die, it reminds you of the penalty of sin. If this little lamb is going to lose, innocent lamb is going to lose its life because of what you have done. The, the cost of sin, the great expensive cost was constantly before them. And so Jesus says, this cost I am pouring out for you. And so this, this table is also in the presence of sacrifice. It is in the presence of Jerusalem, in the presence of lambs that they could perhaps still hear in the distance. Now look at verse 21, because there's one more that this is in the presence of. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. So we have heard that this disciple, that this table is in the presence of Jesus' disciples. That this table is in the, in the presence of one another, in the presence of the sacrifice at the temple. In the presence of God. And this table was done in the presence of the betrayer. And so knowing that Jesus quoted uh, from Psalm 22 at the on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Knowing that, that Jesus would have recited and sung psalms together. Psalms together. 
during this meal. As he says, the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. As Jesus made preparations for his disciples and had two disciples make preparations for everybody else, I reminded of the 23rd Psalm. Where David says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What is an enemy? Literally in Hebrew there in that phrase in the 23rd Psalm, um, the word that is translated as presence means face. I'm looking at the face of my enemy. Well, wouldn't you think that if God's taking care of you that he would have eliminated the, all the enemies? I mean, do they really have to be there? Can't we do it without them in the room? And when Jesus celebrates this this. Last Supper, his enemy is still there. His betrayer is still there. When you and I celebrate the Last Supper, to, the Lord's Supper together, the enemies are still present. The enemies of difficulty and stress is still present. The enemy of difficult relationships is still present. The enemy of temptation and sin still present. And our real enemy, the devil, still around. What does it mean to, for, why is it a good thing for, for God to set a table before you in the presence of your enemy? It means you don't have to be afraid. As a friend of mine pointed out, that when you recite that psalm and you say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, one of the things that means is that God leads you through some scary places. I will fear no evil. And so I will sit and I will have a meal prepared for me by the Lord in the presence of my enemy and I will not be afraid. Jesus is complete and total control of this situation. Because all of these enemies that I described will all be defeated. In fact, already have been when Jesus died and rose again three days later. And so as we celebrate this Lord's Supper together, we, re we recognize there are enemies. But we also recognize that Jesus in giving his life defeated those enemies. Some of those enemies are like Judas. And we want them to experience forgiveness, but they don't. Because Jesus, Judas hung himself, apparently out of guilt. But his attempt was to pay for his own sin with his own blood, and it was not enough. And you can try and punish yourself for your sin, but no matter how much you do it, it will not be enough. The only blood that is sufficient to pay for your sin is the blood of Christ Jesus. Amen. And so if you are here and you know that you have been that enemy, the good news is that you can be like Peter, who was forgiven by Jesus. And when Jesus said, this blood is poured out for you, that means you. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this bread and for this cup. I thank you for this last meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. And he lets us continue to do this. And that we get to also participate in, in continuity with Jesus and his disciples. And with Christians who for thousands of years have done this. And will continue to do this until Christ returns one day. And so, Lord, thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. And so our prayer this morning is that as we celebrate this Lord's Supper together, that it would not be empty ritual, though maybe for many of us we've done it hundreds of times before. Lord, but that we would do this not only in the presence of our friends and our Christian family, but that we would do this in your presence, knowing how much 